I'll tell you what, parenting is a trip, right? Um, if there's anything in this world that we have zero preparation for before we do it, it's parenting. And I think we spend most of our life um, coming to the realization we have no idea what we're doing. And we don't know who thought it was a good idea for us to have little um, kids that we need to keep alive because every day is a journey. Um, and I have four. They are ages 16, 14, 13, and 12. And if you feel like you are a mom today that's just not winning, I'm going to tell you some stories just to prove that you are. It's fine. Um, we all have these moments. Um, we all have the moments where we're like, yeah, um, that was not my greatest moment. Um, one of those was when I was a single mom, and I just want to say just a special shout out to every single mother in this place today. If you are a single mom, I honor you. I know the journey you're walking. I know how hard it is. I know the hard days, the heavy days that there's no one to go home and share the burden with, but you keep doing it and you keep laying your life down for those kids. So I just want to say a special, I love you and thank you for what you're doing in the life of your kids. When I was a single mom, um, we were driving somewhere with um, Shia and Anaya in the car, and um, they were acting up, acting crazy. How many parents have had a crazy kid in the car when you're trying to drive? And it doesn't matter what you say to them. They don't get that this is going to make you crash if you don't chill out. So I result, resulted to the only um, means necessary when parenting, and that's manipulation. Um, and so I turned to the back seat, and I said, if you kids don't chill out. I'm going to call the cops on you and report. Yes, I actually did this and report you to them for um, endangering drivers on the road with your behavior. <laughs> High five me. Um, so we, a couple of stoplights down the road, pull up to a red light and stop. And next to us pulls up a cop. Um, and my kids see this and freak out and think I called the police on them. And Shia, my son, who I think was like eight, seven or eight at the time, starts crying and freaking out, and he's like, Mom, please do not tell them that I was bad. I don't want to go to juvie. Um, so why my eight-year-old thought his option in life was juvie at that point, I don't know. Maybe other things I've said to him, but um, that's what happened. <laughs> um, there was also, um, also a time where uh, once Grant and I got married and we we're bringing these four kids together, um, it was a wild ride trying to get four kids to, um, to just learn and integrate with each other. But they loved each other. They had fun together. Um, and one of those times, I think all four kids were still in elementary school. Uh, they were playing out front. I think it was cooking dinner or something in the kitchen. And I heard a scream. How many parents know when you hear a scream, you don't react, you just wait? You wait to see what happens, because sometimes they're just screaming for the response. Sometimes they're screaming because there's actually an issue. Um, but I waited, and about 20 seconds later, the front door flings open, and I was like, okay, it's, it's on. Um, so they come running in. First one is Shia, and he is freaking out. He is like, Mom, I'm sorry. I just, I was playing, and I thought I was having fun, and I didn't mean to. I'm so sorry. And then Maddie, um, our oldest, walks in with her hand over her eye like this. I was like, okay, here we go, Jesus. Um, and how many know the first rule in parenting is not to react? Especially if you have teenagers, you just smile and go, okay, we're going to figure it out. Um, so I grabbed a hold of that in my head and said, I will not react. And, um, and then I start getting the story of my son out front with a broomstick, um, 300-ing it as hard as he could and declaring to the neighborhood that uh, this is Sparta. And, um, and why he knew that at that age, again, don't judge me, I don't know. But um, he swung that broomstick hard and made contact with Maddie's face right across her eyeball. Um, and so she dropped her hand and was like a fist-sized goose egg on her, uh, on her brow bone. And I just said, okay, um, here's some ice. So I sat her down and she wanted to look at it in the mirror. She was just probably afraid she was going to die or lose her eye or something. Um, and I was like, no, we're not going to look at it. Uh, we're going to wait. Uh, we're going to wait for a while. So she iced it probably for an hour or so before I actually let her look at her face. Um, but we survived. But we survived because as parents, we know that one of the biggest things that we have to do is surrender it all to the Lord. Um, constantly every day we walk in a posture where we don't know what's going on. We don't know what we're doing, but we know that he does, and, um, and he's who we have to follow. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about surrender um, and what that looks like. So let's pray as we get ready for the word. Lord, we just thank you so much. God, we thank you for all the mothers in the house. 
And we thank you for the gift of being able to surrender to you, Lord, the gift that you gave us of surrendering your life so that we could have all of you and walk in relationship with you today. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to talk about the pathway to surrender today. And I absolutely love the word. If you know me, a lot of my young adult ladies in the room know if you've had coffee with me or lunch with me, um, I'll sit and talk with you about the word of God forever. But I love reading it. I love studying it. I love talking about it. And so that's what we're going to do today in regards to the concept of surrender and our walk with the Lord. And when I hear surrender, typically you think about kind of a negative mindset that you're giving up, like a little white flag going up and you're surrendering to the enemy You're giving up your desire and handing it over to opposition. But the actual definition of surrender is the action of yielding one's person or giving up the possession of something, especially into the power of another. To yield to the power, control, or possession of another upon compulsion or demand. And when we think about that in regards to the Lord, how incredible it is that we get to take all of ourself, all of our power, all of our might, and hand it over into his hands. So we're going to talk today about a passage in Scripture that probably most of you are very familiar with. Um, But it's a journey of a woman to surrender and what it looked like to get her heart there. So we're going to go to Mark 5, 25 through 34. And it says this. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him, threw the crowd, and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of this terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out of him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples looked at him. Look at this crowd pressing around you. How could you ask who touched me? But he kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Now, this is a woman who was in turmoil. She was suffering for 12 years in discomfort and pain. Could you just imagine the discomfort of 12 years of this journey? Most of us can't handle small discomfort, right? The AC in my vehicle went out a couple summers ago, and I thought I was literally going to die. It was so hot. And every day that I had to come home with no AC, I was so grumpy and in such a bad mood because of minor discomfort. A few days ago, um, kind of leading into this weekend, our son developed these, this crazy case of hives all over his body, like head to toe. He's even got them on the bottom of his feet. Um, we didn't know what was going on. We tried Benadryl. We tried Zyrtec. We finally got some medication from a doctor um, that got a hold of him a little bit and started helping him get these hives under control. But he was at a place after 48 hours of this constant irritation of his skin that honestly he looked like he was tweaking out. Looked like we had a little drug addict in our home. His eyes were crazy. His hair was crazy. He was like laying on the floor, laying on the couch, taking cold showers, trying to cool his skin down, doing everything he could, just standing at us with crazy eyes, itching like a crazy guy. But that was after 48 hours of discomfort. And we're talking about 12 years. I can't imagine how she felt, but I can guarantee you it got her to a pretty desperate place. This is a woman who was physically desperate, wanted healing so bad. This is a woman who was socially and emotionally desperate. You see in Leviticus 15, it tells us that someone who has Bleeding or an issue like this is actually considered unclean for the duration of seven days after this bleeding is stopped. And at the end of the seven days, they have to go through a sacrificial process, um, and then they are deemed clean again. And I can't imagine what it would have been like for this woman who maybe started bleeding on a Monday, and those seven days started. And then maybe she's three days in, and she starts bleeding again, and the clock starts over And then maybe it's the day after she gets all the way through the process and she's deemed clean again and she starts bleeding again. That means she was just in a constant cycle of cleansing herself and being separated from those that she loved and was community with because she couldn't touch others. She'd make them unclean. 
This was also a woman who was spiritually desperate because not only was she unclean in the eyes of those around her, but she was unclean in the eyes of God. And so she's in this perpetual cycle of bleeding and being unclean and never getting out of it. And I think she probably got herself to a place of saying, does God even want me in his presence? Does he even want me near? She had to have been so desperate and so alone. And that's the first place we're gonna go to today in our pathway to surrender. And it's desperation. And it's this mindset that I'm going to fix it myself. I'm going to get it all taken care of. It's me focused. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do what it takes. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to solve this problem in my life because my desperation is leading me. And it can look different for different people. For her, it was obviously physical healing. For others, it could be a relationship that needs restored, finances that need to be released. It can be even a desperate heart posture for the Lord. But whatever it is, your experience and your circumstances will drive you to desperation with the Lord. Now, that can be a good thing, and we'll get to that. But here's a danger with desperation, is that it very easily can turn to self-striving. We can easily kick in to our own striving to fix the things or get the more that we're seeking from God. That we're so desperate, we feel like something has to change, so we'll do anything to make it happen. And we can even do that in the name of Jesus, right? We can say, I have faith. He's, he said this is what the word says. I have faith that this is what I'm supposed to have. So I'm going to do everything in order to make it happen. I'm going to work myself to the bone in order to make sure I receive it. And this woman did this for 12 years. It says she actually suffered more at the hands of doctors. It says that she spent all of her money trying to figure out how do I make it work? How do I fix it? But here's the problem with striving is that we're never enough. Striving actually takes the place of surrender. It says, I don't want to do the hard work of having to lay myself down, lay my desires down, lay my wants down and accept something different or accept that someone else's control is in control. Striving actually is a form of control and it removes, removes the hand of God from the situation. So in our seeking, we have to ask ourselves, am I seeking this in my own power, in my own control? Am I seeking this in my own striving? And if we are, it's usually a good indication that there's something in our heart that needs to be surrendered. Usually it's not the thing that we're seeking. Usually it's deeper. Striving can look very simple in our everyday lives. I think sometimes we read stories in scripture and we think about just the story in scripture and we're like, well, my life doesn't look like that. But what does it look like for you? It can look as simple as coming home every day and never being satisfied with your day. That it never was enough. It never was good enough. I wasn't good enough. I need to do more. In a marriage, it can look like tying yourself in knots, bending over backwards, to please your spouse, to do everything that you can, to do everything that they want, but inside you're dying because all you're doing is striving for man's approval instead of the Lord's. At work, it can look like overperformance. You overperform when your boss is in the room, when your coworkers are in the room, but when they're not, you underperform because you're exhausted. You've worn yourself out with striving. And your relationship with God, it looks more like you're a taskmaster managing a checklist, that I am reading my devotion every day, I'm reading the word, I did my five-minute prayer, I watched an Instagram video that talked about Jesus, I'm just checking the boxes, but I'm never actually dwelling in the presence of the Lord. So when we are striving for something in our own ability, it doesn't have to be the end point. Or I'm sorry, when we are striving for something in our own ability... It doesn't have to be the end point because it's not connected to an actual source. It's just a cycle of striving, disappointment, desperation. It just continues over and over and over and over. It's like a burnt cake, to be honest. Have you ever burnt something in the oven? Lies. It's like pulling a burnt cake out of the oven and being like, well, I think I can fix this. Um, I'll put some frosting on it. I'll make it look pretty. I'll make it look okay. But at the core of the issue, you cut into that cake. It is still burnt. You didn't fix anything. You just put something nice over top of it. You see, when we say something or strive for something that has no metric, there never is an end to how far you'll go to actually obtain it. 
and it will always feel like an empty hole you can't fill. But when you know who you are and whose you are, it doesn't matter why you are not. And I think this woman in this passage got to a place where she no longer cared about what she was not, and she decided she was going to be led by faith instead. So that takes us to our next stop in the pathway to surrender, and that's a faith-filled resolve. It goes from a head mindset of I'm going to do it to a heart posture of I'm actually going to go after the Lord. So in Hebrews 11.1, 1, we see this. <clears throat> faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. And here's the thing. When we wake up out of desperate striving and decide to fix our eyes on faith instead, we begin to talk different. We begin to walk different. We begin to posture ourselves different because we're no longer doing it our own, but we fix our faith on an expectation that's beyond us, that's bigger than us. We no longer strive for perfection. Instead, we start declaring truth in our life. We don't say, I'm going to do this. We say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We don't say, I've got to fix this all. I've got to do it in my own ability, in my own self. And we say, but God goes before me and behind me, and his hand of peace is laid upon me. You see, the woman had exhausted all of her own resources, all of her striving and ability to fix the issue. Her desperation had driven her to a place of probably just two options, to give up or to put her faith into something more. And here's the thing. I don't think she would have wasted her time with just another preacher or teacher or healer or rabbi because she'd already been doing that for 12 years, right? She had to see Jesus as something more. Most likely, she probably heard rumors about him, about what he was doing, about the power that he held. Maybe she stood on the outskirts of crowds as Jesus was praying for people and ministering to people and healing people and speaking truth. Whatever it was, something had shifted in the heart of this woman. For her to not see him just as another teacher, preacher, healer, rabbi, but to see him as something more. She decided to see him as the answer, the only answer and put her complete faith in him. And here's the other reason I know that she saw him as something more, is it was a massive risk for her to go through that crowd. This is a massive crowd of people that was surrounding Jesus as he was walking to another area in town. And as she would push through, she would make every person she touched unclean, but mostly she would make the rabbi unclean. And if you made a holy man unclean, usually a penalty for that was being stoned to death. So this isn't a woman who was just thinking, oh, let me just try this. This was a woman who knew and believed that this was someone greater. Here's where the passage gets really amazing to me. Because we see evidence that she actually knew that he was the promised Messiah instead of just another healer. So if we go to Mark 5.28, it says, For she thought to herself, if I could just touch his robe, I will be healed. She knew it. She knew she would be healed if she touched his robe. But why? Well, in Malachi 4.2, we, we read this. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. This verse tells the Hebrew people that the Messiah is coming. And he's coming with healing in his wing. So here's the deal. They're going to put a picture up. The Hebrew people were commanded by God to wear tassels on the hem of their gar garment called tzitzits. And if that's not how you say it, I, I don't know what to tell you. I took a year of Spanish and a year of Latin, and Hebrew isn't much better for me. So um, these are called tzitzits. And these were reminders to obey God's commands day and night. And we see this in Numbers 15. Each one of these had five knots, and those five knots represented the, book of the, Torah, the five books of the Torah. It also had four spaces between those knots, and those spaces represented the name of God, Yahweh. The numerical value for the word tzitzit is 600. And when you combine that with five, which is the number of knots, plus eight, which is the number of threads, you get 613, which is the exact number of laws in the Old Testament. So wearing these was actually a literal representation of, of a reminder to obey the commands of God, but not only that, but also to remind them of the promises that he held. So the Son of God will rise with healing in his wings, is what Malachi told us. 
These are some of those garments that they were, and you can see the tassels hanging from the bottom. The Hebrew word for, um, for wings is kanap, which also translates to corner. So the Hebrew people were waiting for the Messiah to come with his kanap, with healing in his kanap, in the corner or wings of his garment. So when this woman pushed through the crowd, she was actually looking for something specific. She knew what she was going after. This wasn't a a chance thing. She was pushing through and looking for the Messiah's kanab. The Hebrew people proclaimed that the Messiah would come with healing in his wings. And so she pushed through and she grabbed on. Not for just another YOLO moment in her life. The risk would be too great to just take a, take a chance. But this is a woman who was led out of desperation into only one option, faith. Isn't that incredible? The simplicity in this verse, we read over it so quickly, but the depth that it holds in the kingdom, and that's exactly how our faith looks with the Father as well. And I think for most of us, we read this passage and we get to this moment of healing and we're like, that's it, that's what it was all about. She was healed, done, moving on. But what God actually showed me is that wasn't the moment. It wasn't what this encounter was all about, that there actually was something more, that her heart still had to enter in to surrender. And so that's the last place we go on this pathway, to surrender. And it takes us from a mindset of I'm going to do it myself to a heart posture if I'm going to go after God, to an understanding that God actually is the one pursuing me. See, the more we go after God, the more we desire from him, the more he actually requires us to lay it all down ourselves. So in Mark 5, 30 through 34, and we've read this already, but we're going to read this part again. It says, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out of him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples asked him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask that? Who touched me? But he kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman trembled at the realization of what had happened to her. She came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Who touched me, he said. Do you think he actually didn't know? This is Jesus. God walking on earth, he knew that Judas was going to betray him before it ever happened. He knew Peter would deny him before it ever happened. And we see countless moments in scripture where he had ordained moments with men and women to bring healing and restoration and salvation. Do you think he really didn't know who touched him? You see, I kind of think of this moment like playing hide and seek with your kiddos when they're little. And they're hiding in plain sight on the couch with a blanket over them. And their feet are probably sticking out. And they're laughing and you can hear them laughing. But as a parent, you do everything you can to just say, where are you? I don't see you. I have no idea where you are. And you let that go on for a while. Because it's building anticipation in the heart of your child. Because it's connecting them to a deeper moment than just a silly little game. And even more so, I believe he knew who she was. Because as soon as she came forward, he called her daughter. I have three girls. I have three daughters. I love them with my whole heart and life. And I love a lot of people and have a relationship with a lot of people in my world. But they are not my daughters. I only call my girls my daughters. They have an access to me. And they have authority in my life like no one else does. And this is what he called her. You see, I think he actually knew who she was. And was just opening the door of opportunity for her to lay her life down so that she could have all of him. Because what she thought she was seeking was physical healing, but what he wanted to give her was all of him. So he gave her a choice. Who touched me? Did she really want more than what she had just received? Who touched me? You see, it was going to reveal her identify her in a crowd of people. She was going to have to lay it all down, her pride, her self-dignity, her fear, her identity, because she would then reveal herself to every person that she just touched, every person that she just made unclean. If she revealed her identity, what would happen? Who touched me? He still asked. 
But in that moment, her desperation drove her to a faith-filled resolve. And God brought her to the doorsteps of surrender. And she said yes. And when she said yes, Christ called her by name. Daughter, you are mine. And so I think, well, real quick, I want, to sh- I want to go to Luke 8, 48. Um, it's just another account of this, of this story. And it says, daughter, your faith, has healed, or your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, in this account, Jesus never said anything about healing. He was after her salvation. Her faith is what saved her. He was never after what she was seeking. He was always after her heart. She wanted relief. She wanted healing. She wanted a lifting of her circumstances. But all he wanted was her heart. So she simply had to say yes. She simply just had to give all of herself. And so my question to you today is, what do you have left to offer the Lord? What is it that you've still held on to? Maybe it's not 12 years. Maybe it is. But what is it that you have left to offer the Savior? All he needs is your simple yes. And typically the things that we're seeking from him are not what he actually desires to give us because what he wants you to have is all of him. Just remember, even if you seek him, even in the things, even in the tangible things that we're chasing after him for, we'll find him because he'll lead us down a pathway of surrender. But when we do, we have to ask ourselves, is he enough? If I never get the things, if the tangible items that I was chasing after him for, if they never are released to me, is he enough? You see, there's two examples in scripture where I see this, and it constantly challenges me, constantly takes me to a place of just seeking the Lord in a deeper way. And one of those is Moses. We know Moses. We know his story. He was the mouthpiece of the Lord to deliver the Israelites out of the Egyptian captivity into the wilderness and then into the promised land. But he got in trouble along the way and, um, and he was told by God he wasn't going to be allowed to go into the promised land. And so at the end of his life, we see in scripture that God actually takes him up to, up to a hill to look into the land that he would never enter into. And I think we sit there and we read that and we go, why wouldn't he have just let him go in? Just a special moment between him and the Lord. And I honestly believe it's because in that moment, it no longer mattered to him. Because what he actually was chasing, what Moses wanted, was what God offered in himself more than what God offered in this world. The second example is Mary, Jesus' mother, Mary. It's very fitting on Mother's Day. And I think about this woman sitting or standing at the foot of the cross, watching her child be sacrificed, be beaten and bruised, be nailed to a cross. See, I would tear the world apart to save my child from something like that. In fact, there was a time when we lived in Jacksonville, Florida. We were pastoring a church there, my late husband and I, and um, we lived in a predominantly black neighborhood. And, um, And so my son went to a school with about, I don't know, 5% Caucasian students in that school. My son, first grader, seven, six years old, was in the bathroom one day, alone, exposed, vulnerable, and one of the white students came in and called him a curse word inward. And he got in the car that day and told me this, and he didn't understand fully the, um, the impact of that word, but he knew he was scared, but I knew. And I marched into that school ready to burn the place down. I will open those doors and I might as well just kick the doors open, ready to, to unleash hell to fight for my child. And so I can't imagine for Jesus or for Mary standing the foot of the cross, watching her son be crucified, what was going on within her. But at the same time, she had to surrender her identity as his mother so that she could accept her identity as his son. See, she needed him more as a savior in that moment than she needed him as her son. She had to surrender her entire heart, her will, and her life to God so that she could have all of him. 
See, in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, if you look for me wholeheartedly with all of your heart, you will find me. God promises all of himself to us. We just have to say yes, and we just have to decide that he is enough. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for who you are, for the sacrifice that you gave. Lord, let our hearts always be postured and surrender towards you, that we hold nothing back, that we seek you wholeheartedly, that we desire all of you. Lord, search our hearts today. Show us where we need you more, where we need to lay ourselves down and say a simple yes to you. In your name we pray, amen. Before we walk away from this moment, I wanna spend some time just making an invitation. Maybe as you were listening to this message, something was stirring in your heart to say, you know what, I, I don't even know if I've given him my first yes. I don't know if I've even laid my life down to accept him as Lord and Savior in my life. Or maybe you have, and your 12 year journey is that you've walked away from the Lord, that you've run from him, that instead of saying yes, you've said no, and you've pushed him away. And as we talk today, there's something just pulling in your heart that says, Lord, I need you back. I need you again. And so in just a moment, I'm gonna ask that you raise your hand and we're gonna pray with you if that's you. But I want you to know this is the greatest and best yes you can ever say. So on the count of three, if that's you, I'm gonna just ask you to raise your hand and we wanna celebrate with you and pray with you. One, two, three. If that's you, just simply raise your hand. In the upper room, there's people that will pray with you. I see you. Amen. Online, you can let us know in the comments. Amen. I'm so glad that you said yes today. What that means for your heart and your life is greater than you can ever imagine. We're gonna pray with you today. Church, if you all will just join me in praying with her. Say, so, dear Heavenly Father, I confess I have sinned and need you as my savior. I surrender my whole life to you today. Lord, come into my heart, come into my life. Help me walk with you every day. I give you my heart, I give you my life. And I say yes to you today, Father. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. So awesome, so glad. Well, church, I just pray that this week your heart is surrendered to the Lord. You give him your all and you never stop chasing after him and what he has to offer you.